And we have to think of, uh, think of uh, uh, why, why is the case that communication has become unmoored from any other purpose apart from itself. You can say, like, you know, that there was, uh, you know, cybernetics as a science was a study of, you know, um, communication and control. That's, that's defined by Norbert Wiener um, when he invented the term in the 40s. But now we have control by communication, I would argue. And it does, um, I, I think some, some of the best theorists on this um, with, uh, uh, writing the 70s, actually, and uh, the, I would say uh, Jean Baudrillard, if you read back his texts about communication, the onset of communication, that these texts are amazing. These texts now, uh, read Baudrillard's text, uh, The Ecstasy of Communication, which I think has maybe come out the either late 70s or early 80s, I, a bloody long time ago. And uh, this is basically a description of what it is to be on Twitter. You know, uh, where you're, there's, uh, if, you, if you read these texts, they're all about that constant, um, the, the, the inability to construct a, um, a coherent self anymore uh, in, in the face of this constant input, uh, uh, instant, instantaneity, a kind of schizo subjectivity, as Baudrillard puts it, which has no halo, halo of private protection anymore. This is what you and, and when you when you go back to read these texts of Baudrillard, you think, what was he seeing in his own day with the bloody French Minitel system, and in the eighties where you could barely make a phone call? You know, it's almost like you time travelled into our period and was writing about that in lots of ways. Because it would take, so, so, I mean, what, I'm, what, what, what we're talking about then is a synergy between um, and a really bad one between uh, the imperatives of the dominant form of capitalism now. And the um, and certain communication technologies, a synergy between those two things, and that's that, that's why I'm saying that I think Twitter is much more. Um, Twitter is now the, the leading edge, not Facebook. I mean, um, because of the screaming low-level panic that is, that is just just a feature of being on Twitter. Um, How can we evaluate the contribution made by Vina to our thinking today? Well, it would be difficult to overestimate that contribution. The thinking started by Wiener with his concern for feedback systems is likely to have a much greater impact on society than the word games of traditional philosophy. Society is complex and made up of a number of different elements. All these different elements are interacting and affecting each other in various ways. So we get a number of complex systems, a number of interactive systems. Now, unless we can understand feedback systems, circular systems, stable systems, unstable systems, then we're not going to begin to cope with the complexity of society. And that was where Wiener started the thinking that we need to deal with that situation. But there is another aspect. In the organization revolution, which has already started, though many people may not have noticed it, much of the thinking is based on feedback and control systems. Cybernetics, the science of cycles. Cybernetics is hard to understand. It explains complexity and wholeness. An insight to free you from darkness, carry you into the daylight of a purer reason. Science has to take the broad view, to think laterally, to see complex problems in the round. 
But before cybernetics, science was ill at ease with complexity, content with the simple logic of cause and effect. That narrowed what it could do, made it think in straight lines. Yet linear thinking is little help in a world where lines are rarely straight. Where things flow in circularities and cycles, moonrise and the ebb of the tide, breeding time locked into the cycle of the sun. Our world is full of strange twists and forces. Cycle interlocks with cycle to create great dynamic systems. Cybernetics asks a deep question about them. What mechanism is common to all cycles, from trees to machines? That mechanism is information. Instructions. Um, <clears throat> the two ideas that have come came up this morning that, that I was uh, particularly noticed are first of all this notion of cyberspace and the virtual being something of a metaphor or a symbolic zone or somehow some immaterial um, space. This is one idea that I really uh, want to contest. The second is that there's some the notion that it's somehow necessary from a woman's point of view to go in and somehow feminize uh, cyberspace according to some usually pre-existing notion of the feminine and I want to suggest really that the matrix as I hope you'll see by the time I've finished is already very much hostile to masculine identity and that there's no great need for us to rush in and somehow turn it into something <laughs> female but first of all on this question of um, cyberspace itself being supposedly immaterial a matter of symbolism, uh, metaphor, an imaginary zone. Um, this is really um, the tendency to, to make cyberspace, us to make many things into a matter of metaphor or representation, is really a matter of repeating the great idealist project which has characterised Western patriarchal culture, which has always been an attempt to somehow climb out of matter to get into some immaterial a zone, a zone that would be both insubstantial and ineffectual, those two senses of the word immaterial. And we can see even with this with cyberpunk itself that it, even after there's been so much said about the collapse between, uh, of, of the distinction between social reality and science fiction that people still want to make science, uh, cyberpunk itself into simply a matter of fiction, again a metaphor somehow for our times. Um, and this even after we've seen the, the real effect in the world which cyberpunk has obviously already had. And even the body, finally, in this high-tech world, somehow it gets back onto the agenda, or perhaps onto the agenda for the first time. But again, it's a matter of metaphor. Even this session today is called the body as metaphor. Metaphor for what is the question that I want to really be asking. And this tendency to turn everything into immateriality is really, as I say, an old trick of Western patriarchy. And cyberspace can, of course, always be seen and, and will has been seen largely as the fulfilment of this great dream, again, of getting out of the meat, getting out of matter. As I say, it's an ancient dream. It really goes back at least as far as to the sort of sources of Western philosophy with Socrates, who himself says, if ever we are to have pure knowledge of everything, anything, we must get rid of the body and contemplate things by themselves with the soul by itself. So Socrates, and consequently the whole history of Western culture, has really dreamt of some notion of the soul being separate and independent of the body. He says, it seems as long as we are alive, we will continue closest to knowledge if we avoid as much as we can all contact and association with the body, except when absolutely necessary. And instead of allowing ourselves to become infected with its nature, purify ourselves from it until God himself gives us deliverance. So there's very much this attempt to be purified, to escape from the body, to escape its contamination. As I say, it's inevitable that cyberspace would, of course, have been welcomed into this sort of culture as the ultimate chance to finally make this escape from the meat, or as I say, to become simply a symbolic uh, zone, an immaterial zone. Uh, finally, we get to the great dream of the Western of Western culture, the body as metaphor, finally removed from all of its visceral activity, its blood and guts and all the messy stuff that man would always rather have left behind. 
And so cyberspace does really feed, obviously, this dream for total control, for autonomy, for the perfect end of the great Western uh, patriarchal project, the great resolution of the masculine identity crisis, the point at which the soul would finally be united with itself. Well, in order to, to answer your question, I will quote your book, uh, the, 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 the book uh, The Wretched uh, um, of the Screen. In 1977, David Bowie released the single Heroes. He thinks of a new brand of hero, just in time for the neoliberal revolution and for the digital transformation of the world. The hero is dead. Long live the hero. Yet, Bowie's hero is no longer a subject, but an object, a thing, an image, a splendid fetish, a commodity soaked with desire, resurrected from beyond the squalor of its own demise. Just look at a 1977 video of the song and you will understand why. The clip shows Bowie singing to himself from three simultaneous angles with layering techniques tripling his image. Not only has Bowie's hero been cloned, he has above all become an image that can be reproduced, multiplied and copied, a riff that traverses effortlessly through commercials for almost anything, a fetish that packages Bowie's glamorous and unfazed post-gender look as product. Bowie's hero is no longer a larger-than-life human being carrying out exemplary and sensational exploits, and he is not even an icon, but a shiny product endowed with post-human beauty, an image, and nothing but an image.